director of University of Wyoming Ecology Program, Robert Hall, studies streams and rivers. He joins Jeff Lockwood to explain the difference between ecology and environmentalism. So here you are and uh, in this new capacity, program in ecology, and one of the things that I know comes to mind very quickly for people in Wyoming and, and, and when people hear ecology is this move to sort of equate ecology and environmentalism. And I know that's been kind of an issue with, with ecology and ecologists and maybe even with the program in ecology. Could you say something about what the similarity and difference is? Where does ecology and environmentalism begin? Is there a, is there a good relationship between science and politics? What's, uh, should those things be together, pulled apart, or what's the story? Well, I tell my students, I teach general ecology to undergraduates, and I think a lot of students don't really know what ecology is until they take this sort of class. And mm -hmm. I, I emphasize to them on the first lecture that ecology is not environmentalism. Okay. And ecology is the science to understand, uh, to understand how the natural world works. And, uh, and environmentalism is, is a sort of a moral and an ethical view as to how we humans ought to interact with this world. And, and, and so I try to avoid any sort of political um, any sort of political statements or this is the way you have to be, I want them to understand the science, the science of ecology, because it's only with that science that you can then use it to help make decisions later. And so ecology is just one of the environmental sciences that we can use to better manage. How we do that is, is to, I think, a large degree of a political decision. And so I think we then, as ecological, as, as citizens, as students who are going to take my class, and then as scientists like you and me, we should be spending our time thinking about how we can make sure that the best science is in the hand of the people who are going to be making these decisions. So the, so the argument would be, yes, there's a relationship, but it's the raw material for good politics? But ecology, yes. you mean? Yeah, so is eco fair? ecology is the raw material to make, to make decisions. Uh, the science that we learn, so um, I, work in the, I work in the Grand Canyon, um, uh, studying, uh, studying energy flow through food webs there, and our science is supposed to be part of the adaptive management pro process, okay. where the people who manage the dam, who are stakeholders, say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z based on what we know about how this ecosystem works. And so our science is directly supposed to support that. Um, we do not make the decisions as to how they run the, uh, how they run the dam. We are not the stakeholders. Okay, so, I mean, so one of the things that we, as a society, would want out of ecology, mm -hmm. right, is is answers, right? Answers to what's going to happen if, what's going to happen when. So ecologists tell us what the consequences of climate change are. Tell us what the consequences of the arrival of a new weed or a new species is. Tell us what the you know uh, what are the consequences of an oil spill is. Mm -hmm. Um, but from what I can tell, ecologists oftentimes struggle, right, to make these sort of predictions, to make these sorts of forecasts. Is that asking too much of ecology, or I don't think or, it's ask, I don't think it's asking too much of ecology at all. I think it's all okay. I think it's the holy grail we should be we should be <laughs> trying to seek. But we should also be recognized at what point we can and what time we can't predict. And so, for example, we cannot predict how the economic. Uh, system is going to change over short, sometimes short and long time scales. Yet we humans developed this economic system. We did not develop the natural world. We and so it, I think it's anything more complicated. Now that doesn't mean we just are nihilists, just raise our hands <laughs> and walk away from being predictive. We try to figure out the scope at which our predictions are going to be able to work, why they don't work, and then design our next studies to get them to be a little bit more predictive than they were before. So are humans in or out, right? So, so is, is human economics actually, in a sense, a part of ecological? Oh, they certainly okay. are. They certainly are. There's definite feedbacks there. Mm -hmm. And so we alter the natural world, and then that's going to feed back and alter how we interact with it. And, uh, and, and, and so that, that I th that's, a, um, that's a frontier of, uh, of ecological and economic, economic work is to have that, have that put have those together. To put the humans in the ecosystem. Okay. Um, and so you know, we need to study natural ecosystems from the sense that this is what, it, this is what we think they, these things behave like without, uh, without humans, but then, but then we need to have the humans in the, uh, in the, in the models and in the studies. Well, another issue that kind of revolves around all of this is the relationship between science and society. And, and let's face it, some science is just plain esoteric. It's hard to figure out what was done, why it was done, and who cared. Mm -hmm. And 
and political pundits and critics of science, you know, especially in these times of, of tight budgets, look and at various titles and grant proposals and whatnot, and they say, well, that can't possibly be a good use of, of public funding. So they might, they might look through a journal and find a title like this one. Linking calcification by exotic snails to stream carbon dioxide cycling. And at that point, the naysayer sneers and says something like, so the scientists are telling us that it's the snails that are responsible for s carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or something snarky like that. Well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a weird title, right? The link between calcification of snails and carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting if we could figure out what the hell was going on. And here we have an author of the paper. And so tell us that very strange sort of association that one might just sort of raise their eyebrows and say, why would the public care about snails and carbon dioxide? Why would the public care about snails and carbon dioxide? Okay, well for that I gotta give you a little bit of context. And so, uh, so you need a little bit of the ecology behind it. And so as ecologists we need to, uh, one of the central um, uh, uncertainties with global climate change are how the biota, the, the plants and animals, are going to uh, respond and feed back in the climate system by producing and consuming carbon dioxide, which is the, which is a, which is a potent, which is a do the dominant greenhouse gas. And so we, 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 we need to know how, you know, what are the CO2 fluxes. And some previous so fluxes work, where meaning, it goes in and where yeah, it comes so, out. Yeah, so yeah, so consumption and production okay. of CO2 by the by, by the biota, and there's been several papers that suggest that that uh, clams and corals and things that make uh, calcium carbonate shells. shells? Okay. What they do is when they do this is they take two molecules of dissolved calcium, they uh, a, a calcium bicarbonate they in the take, water. In the water, one goes into the shell and the other gets converted to carbon dioxide. So they're producing they're carbon producing dioxide. carbon dioxide when they when they make new shell biomass. Okay. And so people have been publishing papers saying, wow, look, snails are a large CO2 flux and clams are a large flux CO2 being flux. A lot, they're, they're, a, they're a producer of CO2. Yeah, they're consume, they're producing all this CO2. And so we found a stream in, uh, in, in the Grand Teton National Park, Kelly Warm Springs, that has mm -hmm. a tremendous population of exotic snails from aquarium releases. <sighs> And the bottom of this is just covered just with snails. And we thought, well, this is a perfect place to test this. Can these snails create a lot of CO2? And the answer is, yes, they do. But the more complicated answer is, but not at all relative to the CO2 fluxes, the, that is the import and export of CO2 caused by algae and bacteria that live mm. in this stream. And so the finding is that, is that, yes, these things can make these fluxes, but it's small relative to other ones. And, 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 and while, so, so no, the answer is they're not contributing to global climate change, um, but we need to know these things so that we can check it off our list as things to worry about at the very least. So there's wor the reason to worry about these, about snails and exotic creatures, but their contribution to climate change is probably not going to be that them. much. It's probably not going to be that much. Uh, but, uh, but they have definitely altered the, we believe they've altered the, the native invertebrate uh, assemblage in that, in that, in that stream too. Uh, be, just because there's so many of them. And there's also lots of non-native fishes in there from aquariums. Well, I want to thank you for your time. It's, um, I, I think you've shed some, some powerful light on the, the, the line between science and politics, and perhaps um, we've come to a better understanding of the ways in which humans are increasingly a part of the story, um, but in a sense, maybe our values still need to be separated from the way in which we do science. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.